Good evening, everyone. My name is Michelle Fernandez, and I am from the Department of Programs and Partnerships here at Arlington Public Library. Thank you so much for joining us today to hear Tyler Anbinder discuss his book, City of Dreams, the 400-year epic history of immigrant New York. In the spirit of today's subject matter, I can reveal to you that my ancestors came to New York from Puerto Rico, Italy, and various locations within the Jewish Pale of Settlement. We're not really sure. Special thanks to our partners at One More Page Books for being with us tonight and making copies of City of Dreams available for purchase. Join us and them on February 8th at 7 p.m. here in Central Library Auditorium as author Stephen Levingston discusses his book, Kennedy and King, as part of the library's commemoration of Black History Month. You can also visit us online at library.arlingtonva.us and follow us on social media for the most current listing of upcoming library programs. Our speaker tonight, Tyler Anbinder, is a professor of history at George Washington University. His first book, Nativism and Slavery, won the Avery Craven Prize of the Organization of American Historians. His second book, Five Points, won the New York City Book Prize in 2001. And he served as consultant to Martin Scorsese for Gangs of New York. His ancestors came to New York from Southwest Germany, Poland, Ukraine, and Russia. There will be time after the talk for a question and answer session. And as we are filming this evening's event, um, please wait for the microphone to get to you before asking your question. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming Tyler Ann Binder. All right, well, thanks for coming out. Um, so I'm gonna talk for the next no more than 45 minutes about uh, this book, uh, City of Dreams, which is a history of immigrant life in New York City from the first Dutch settlers to the present. And I know that, and, and then we'll have time for questions. I know one of, the, one of the groups that's here tonight is one of the library book clubs, the nonfiction book club. And when I talk to book clubs, I'm often asked, why did you decide to write this book? So I thought maybe I would address that first and, get it out of the way. Um, there were two reasons I decided to write this book. One was because I wanted a narrative challenge. I'd written, as Lisa described, I'd written two previous books that were kind of straightforward. One looked at the history of a short-lived political party from its birth in 1853 till its uh, dissolution in 1860. The other one looked at the history of one single four by six block neighborhood in New York City. Uh, from its settling around 1800 to the time it was pretty much, it was kind of destroyed by urban renewal right around 1900. So those were pretty straightforward. Uh, looking for something that was a challenge that I hadn't done before, uh, this occurred to me. I thought, what could be more challenging than trying to write a story that covers 400 years? And in particular, what I was hoping to do was to figure out a way that I could successfully keep the reader engaged in a story that didn't have a single protagonist, but had dozens of protagonists. Um, in a sense, I made the city itself the protagonist and the, the immigrants kind of uh, supporting, the supporting actors and actresses, as it were. And then the other reason I decided to try to write this book was in writing the previous book, Five Points, about that one little neighborhood, I came up with so many great stories uh, about immigrants who didn't live in that neighborhood. Uh, and as I collected them over the years, I thought, you know, I, I just ought to do something with these. And, and, and that, was, that was the other reason I decided to write this book. So, just go over here. So first, uh, even though it's a big book, as, as you can see, it's 550 pages of text, and then when you add the, the footnotes, and you know, we academics, we have to have our footnotes, or endnotes, to be exact. Uh, with the endnotes, it's 700 pages long. But still, the, the book has three main themes that tie the narrative together from beginning to end. The first of those is, uh, there we go. The first of those is that the immigrant experience what it's like to arrive, the dis disorientation, the struggle to create a foothold in a new homeland, the discrimination that immigrants face, uh, 
and their eventual adaptation to America, that those things had never varied much throughout American history. That the experience, the experience that uh, an immigrant had in the 1600s isn't that much different than the experience an immigrant has in the 1900s or even here in the 21st century. Sure, the, the uh, specifics of it might be different. You know, you might, uh, uh, you might try to, to cure your homesickness through the internet today versus letters or newspapers back then. But that homesickness is the same. And, and, and so whereas these, these other things will change, the home, that, that whole idea of the, the process you go through doesn't change very much. Um, Assimilation in particular is one of those elements that hasn't changed very much. One of the things you will hear a lot in the immigration debate today is this idea that today's immigrants don't assimilate like my grandparents did. That's often the way you'll hear it phrased. Uh, and I argue in the book that that's not true, that today's immigrants assimilate exactly the same way that your grandparents did or your great-great-grandparents did. Um, in part, that's because we all overestimate how much our immigrant ancestors actually assimilated. To us, if we knew them, they seemed kind of American. Maybe they had an accent, but still they were one of us. They were part of their family. They were familiar. But to people who didn't know your immigrant ancestor, their, that accent and everything else about them made them extremely foreign to them, made them seem completely un-American to them. And so it's not that immigrants uh, assimilate, that adult immigrants assimilate so much today. My, my, what I argue is that adult immigrants, people who arrive in the United States once they're already adults, they don't assimilate that much. They don't assimilate as much as native-born Americans typically would like. You know, they, they typically look at their, when they, talk, when they use the word home, they typically mean the place they were born. Uh, the foods they eat are typically the foods that they ate as children. Um, the songs they sing are typically the songs they sang as children. The music they listen to is typically the music from their homeland. But that that's always been the case. And that is the case today, just like it was the case 100 years ago, 200 years ago, and so forth. And finally, every generation of... of uh, of Americans contains a significant population um, that believes immigrants are a menace to American society, that they're fundamentally different for, than those from the past. So in some ways, I feel like um, you know, the, the kind of reaction you see to immigrants today uh, that is wary, that is distrustful, that is full of animus, um, it's to be expected because that's, there's always been a portion of the American population that's felt that way, that feels threatened in one form or another by the people who are coming to the United States, who they feel will change the United States in a way that they don't like. So, it's, so whereas we think of the United States as a nation of immigrants, which is accurate, um, we've always been a nation of immigrants that has had a significant portion of the population that doesn't like that fact or, or doesn't like the extent to which that is the case. And so it's kind of a yin and yang thing. We've always had both. And they kind of exist in a balance. And every once in a while, the balance gets off a little. But typically, uh, the balance is restored. So I had to make, again, this is in particular, uh, I mentioned this because of the people in the book group who've already read the book uh, and like to think about these things, I had two big decisions I had to make when writing the book. The first was, how would I keep the book from being reading like an encyclopedia? Because I did not want to write an encyclopedia. I wanted it to have a story with a beginning, middle, and an end. I didn't want it to read like a textbook. So what I decided to do was, rather than try to discuss all the hundred some odd immigrant groups that have lived in New York City over its 400 year history, that for each period in the city's history, I would choose a couple of groups that would represent all immigrants in that era. And those groups would uh, serve as the examples of what was happening to everyone, even though I wouldn't mention all the groups. 
And the second decision I made was that I would choose certain immigrants and tell their stories in details. And these exemplary immigrants, and I don't mean exemplary in the sense that they were especially well behaved, but I mean exemplary because they literally um, exemplify the kinds of things that immigrants were going through in that period of the city's history. And so those immigrant stories provide the narrative glue that holds the story of the millions of New York immigrants together. So even though it might sound crazy to try to summarize this whole 400 year story in the next 31 minutes I have left, I'm going to try to do it. Because after all, it was crazy to try to write this book in the first place, but I, but I did it anyway. So I, I can't tell you how many times I was told that. When, when I would tell people what I was doing, I would get that look that, that are you crazy? You can't do that. So the first group to come to New York are the Dutch. And of course, New York, when it starts, is not New York. It's New Amsterdam. And the Dutch kind of get into the, the colonization game a little late. The English are already here. The Spanish are already here. And the French are already in North America before the Dutch get involved. And like a lot of those other groups, the Dutch didn't mean to get involved in colonizing North America. Their goal, as had been the goal for all those other groups I just mentioned, was to find a shorter passage to Asia in order to, to conduct the spice and the silk trade that was so profitable. And so the first uh, explorers who came in this direction for the Dutch were sent for the express and sole purpose of finding a passage to Asia. And so Henry Hudson, who is English, but ha and had actually done some exploring for the English, and the English eventually gave up on him, but the Dutch hired him, and they told him, only look for a passage to Asia. Don't do anything else. But as was the case with many of these explorers, whenever they would find something that looked like they could make some money off it, they would get diverted. And that was the case with Hudson. Although Hudson, to his credit, he did. He comes to the North American coast. He explores all the rivers. The best one he finds, the biggest one he finds is the Hudson. He sails up the Hudson. He, he for a while, the Hudson, I don't know if you've ever been up the Hudson. It, it, after you leave New York, it narrows a little. And then it starts getting wider again. And so Hudson thought, oh, great, it's getting wider. I'm going to open up into this big sea that's going to lead me right to Asia. But no, it led him to Albany instead. So. <laughs> He gets to Albany, where the river pretty much peters out. And there's not much there except uh, some Indians who have lots of furs, beaver furs. And so Hudson goes back, and he reports to the Dutch, this is what I found. And the Dutch are like, we don't care about these furs. Go off, do more exploring. Um, Hudson ends up, he does more exploring. He goes up to what's now uh, kind of northern Canada. His crew re revolts against him because he's, he is really determined to try to find a passage. And so he goes up into that northern part of uh, Canada in the Arctic now, uh, and his crew revolts against him, and they put him in a dinghy and push him out to sea, and the crew goes back to Europe. And so Hudson dies with his son in this dinghy someplace up, up in northern Canada. And the amazing thing is, today, thanks to climate change and global warming, the place where Hudson was set adrift, you can actually sail through, because the ice has melted so much, you can actually sail through to Asia now. So Hudson was actually exactly in the right place. He was just 400 years too early. Now, the Dutch, the story of New Amsterdam is typically told this way. It's typically told that New York gets the character that it, it, it will have, one that's very accepting of immigrants because the Dutch themselves are very accepting of strangers, that the, the Netherlands, being this little country in Europe, um, has always been, that had always been welcoming of people from other places. And, and that's true. But New Amsterdam was not that way, it turns out. So, so Peter Stuyvesant, who ran New Amsterdam for most of its history, was a very unwelcoming kind of guy. Um, so much so, he wanted pretty much only the Dutch and nobody but the Dutch. And if you were going to come to New Amsterdam and you weren't Dutch, you had to follow very strict rules. So um, Stuyvesant's employers said to him, you know, you have to accept anybody who will come. We've got hardly anyone who's willing to live in this barren wilderness. 
So Stuyvesant agrees to let other people live there, but with restrictions. So um, the colony practices the religion of the Dutch Reformed Church. When some Lutherans from Germany show up, he says, you can stay, but you can't practice your religion. And when some Jews show up, the same thing. You can stay, although he really doesn't want to let them stay at all, but he's ordered to let them stay by his employers, but you definitely can't practice your religion. Quakers come, and he won't even let them stay at all. They literally are dragged out of the colony by their hair, uh, the women, put onto a boat and shipped away. Um, because Stuyvesant wanted a place that was very homogeneous and where it was clear who was in charge and that that was the Dutch. But that didn't last very long because, as I said, the Dutch get into this colonization game late and the amount of land they have is very small. The other problem is that there aren't very many people in Holland who want to go to America. This is the period, this is, is kind of the golden age of the Netherlands with uh, you know, the great painters of that period, scientific invention. And the Dutch are so rich, nobody has a desire to emigrate because everything's fine where they live. Um, and so, the col so their co even their colony starts to fill up with people from other places, especially the English, who control the territory north and east of, of Manhattan Island. And so eventually, the English so overwhelm the Dutch that the English decide, we're just going to expand our colony and take New York. It's the best harbor on the east coast of North America. And we're going to make New Amsterdam into New York, after the Duke of, named after the Duke of York, and made it, make it into the hub of our Caribbean uh, Atlantic trading network. And so in the 1660s, the English send a flotilla uh, of naval vessels and sail into New York Harbor and take uh, New Amsterdam from the Dutch, and they turned it into New York. Now, it's true at this point, and here's one of the more famous immigrants for, uh, who will move to, to New York. It's true that in New York, the English were much more accepting of people who weren't English than the other English colonies. So in New England, New England uh, colonies like Massachusetts were very much run by the Congregationalists, um, the Puritans. Um, Virginia had its kind of elite. But in New York, um, they were more accepting of other people, in part because when the English get there, there aren't many English in Manhattan, and there are a lot of Dutch, and they all stay. And the English want them to stay because they're part of what's making the city very successful. So the English, when they take over, um, when they take over New York, they don't go about doing any sort of ethnic cleansing. They encourage the Dutch to stay. They let the Dutch stay. They let the Dutch stay in positions of power within the colony. And so New York does become, in a sense, the first multi-ethnic colony in uh, North America that the English have. And that perhaps does explain why the city will become more tolerant of immigrants than, than other parts uh, than other parts of British North America. So as I said, there are, the main reason the English take over New York is because they want to make New York the nexus of this trading hub that they want to have between their colonies in the Caribbean, which are producing lots of sugar and tobacco, and use New York as a transshipment point so that that stuff will go from there to the, American, to the North American colonies and especially the Port of New York, and from there will either be traded in the uh, continental North America or shipped to England. One of the people who ends up arriving in New York as a result of that is Alexander Hamilton. So Hamilton is born in the Caribbean. He's raised in St. Croix. He works, after he becomes an orphan, he starts working for a trading firm that does most of its business with New York. And so the, the people who run the firm will leave Hamilton, who's still a teenager, in charge uh, of the Caribbean office, of the St. Croix office, when they go off to New York to buy goods that they're going to then bring back to St. Croix and sell. And so Hamilton learns of what's going on on the continent. 
And when he becomes famous in St. Croix for writing, at, there's this big hurricane in St. Croix, and he writes a letter describing the hurricane that everyone says, wow, what a great letter. Who is this? Who is the person who wrote this fabulous letter? And then when they find out it's an orphan uh, who's had no formal education at all, people say, oh my gosh, this guy, is, he's a genius. We ought to give him a formal education. Let's send him off to, to the mainland to college. And so that's what they do. Um, and Hamilton, being ambitious, gets to, gets to New York, and he decides not to go back to the Caribbean. Uh, he realizes that, that places like New York on the North American continent are going to be the real source of power within North America. And of course, he becomes a supporter of the revolution as well. It's not a coincidence that Hamilton, whose parents are both of Scotch descent and whose uh, parents, in fact, were both born in Scotland, um, that he feels very comfortable in New York because New York's revolutionary supporters in particular are very much especially Scotsmen and Scotswomen. And so there is this kind of ethnic dimension to the revolution in a city like New York, whereas the Scots and the Irish are very supportive of the revolution and the English tend to be less supportive of it. I could talk about Hamilton a long time, but obviously I could talk about all these things a long time, but we have to keep moving. So as I said, the Scots and the Irish are the two big supporters of the revolution in New York. And so you have this, this continuing, changing flow of immigrants to New York. First the Dutch, then mostly the English. By the eve of the revolution, more Scots are coming to New York than English. And by the early 1800s, uh, and certainly by, say, the 1820s and 30s, more Irish are coming to New York than Scots. And there are a couple of reasons for this. Um, Ireland being a colony of Great Britain, um, it becomes impoverished in part because of the way that the English um, take advantage of the Irish. They take their land. Um, they exploit it. They give very little of the returns to the English. Most of the land in Ireland is taken from the Irish and given to English nobility as prizes for supporting the king. So obviously there's a lot of resentment of that in Ireland. And so a lot of those resentful people who remember that their family once owned land and now has to rent back what once was their own land from other landlords now, they're resentful of that. And so a lot of those people will go to America and some of them will, will settle in New York. As you move on in the 1800s, the, the immigrants from Ireland become poorer and poorer as, as, the, as Ireland becomes poorer and poorer. By the time you get to the 1840s, a huge portion of the Irish population, especially in kind of the southern and western parts of Ireland, um, become very dependent on the potato. They have so little land um, on which to grow crops because Ireland's population uh, keeps growing and growing. Um, that the Irish become dependent on the potato because the potato is pretty much the only thing they can grow on the tiny little bit of land they have that will feed their families. And the potato, you know, not in French fry form, but the potato overall is, is pretty nutritious. You get some vitamin C from it, and you can actually live just eating potatoes. And that was how, you know, probably half the people who lived in Western Ireland lived solely on potatoes. Uh, potatoes for breakfast, potatoes for lunch, potatoes for dinner. And I don't mean potatoes with other stuff, I mean only potatoes. And so you're, you're and even though you might be poor, you could afford a lot of potatoes without much money. And, and so your typical Irish man in this period would eat 12 to 14 pounds of potatoes a day. And a woman would eat eight pounds of potatoes a day. And that was the diet in Western Ireland. And, but there wasn't much variety to that diet. Um, the potatoes were boiled. They, you couldn't bake them because people didn't have ovens. You couldn't fry them because people didn't have the means to fry them. So they're boiled. Boiled for breakfast, boiled for lunch, boiled for dinner. So when this fungus comes to Ireland in the mid-1840s, and the fungus actually comes from the United States, or to be exact, the fungus comes from Peru. Uh, Americans import Peruvian guano, bird droppings, to fertilize their potato crops that there's a fungus in this guano that then infects the American potato plants. 
but because we have hot, dry summers, the fungus can't really thrive, so it dies off. But then the Irish buy seed potatoes from the United States and plant them in Ireland. And in Ireland, where it rains all the time, and it's never too hot, and it's always moist, the fungus thrives, and it destroys the potato crop in 1845, and 1846, and 1847. And so if you're totally dependent on the potato, and now by 1847, 90% of the potato crop is destroyed by this fungus, um, people who are already just barely eking out an existence are now literally starving. So of a population of about 8 million Irish uh, before the famine uh, starts in 1845, about 1 million of those 8 million die in Ireland of starvation or starvation-related diseases. And another 1 to 1 and a half million who can afford it flee Ireland. And the vast majority of them go to the United States. And the place they go more than any place else is New York. And so New York fills with Irish immigrants in the 1840s. So that by 1855, half the population of New York is foreign born. And so you know, if you go to New York today, it may seem like a place with a lot of immigrants, but the percentage of immigrants there today is about a third. So we're talking about now half in 1855. So it's even more of an immigrant city then than now. And so the first place, as you can see here, we're talking starting in 1827, that the Irish settle in New York in that pre-famine period are the poorest, cheapest parts of town. And Five Points is that place. Five Points is in what's now Lower Chinatown, kind of where Chinatown meets the courthouse district in New York, if you're familiar with that. Um, and it's the poorest, cheapest place to live in New York because it was laid out over what had been a lake. And they didn't do a very good job of draining the lake. It turned out the lake was supplied by an underground, uh, by an underground source. And so as soon as they built the houses, the houses started to, to kind of uh, tilt and lean and rot. And in those days, not understanding uh, how germs worked and bacteria and viruses, people associated sickness with dampness and vapors. And there was no damper place in New York than Five Points. So the rents there became very cheap. And of course, where do the Irish then go to settle? But in Five Points. And so this is a painting of Five Points from, as, a, as you see here, 1827. And one of the things you, you notice here is there are both whites and blacks that because the African-American population of the city is also poor, and so they live there too. And so you get, so Five Points becomes notorious not just because it's so poor and it's so Irish, but because you have this mixing of the races here that you don't have in any other part of the city. Despite the poverty into which they arrive, the Irish, like all the immigrants before them, do fairly well once they've settled and adjusted to life in America. Now, of course, I'm talking about the people who survive. A good portion of the famine immigrants who arrive uh, are so weakened by the famine that they die within a few years of arrival. And then, of course, just in general in those days, people didn't live very long. You know, the, the, the average life expectancy in, in the 1850s was 40 years. So a lot of these immigrants will die, but the ones who survive, uh, they do fairly well. They, do they Earn, do they save, earn as much and save as much money as native-born Americans? No. But still, compared to what they came from, where they were able to save typically nothing at all, they do fairly well. This is an image of Irish immigrants at the Emigrant Savings Bank in New York, which was set up specifically for Irish immigrants. Um, and these kinds of images make the press because the, eventually, this is the 1880s, 25, what, 35 years after the potato famine, the press starts to see, and the New Yorkers start to see that, you know, well, the Irish, they're not so poor as we thought. And they, they may not look middle class, but that's because, like immigrants in all periods, they don't tend to be conspicuous consumers. They tend to put every penny they have either in the bank or they send it to their relatives back in Ireland to pay their rent or to ease their retirements. Uh, and so I've, in the, the project I'm working on now, I, I'm looking at, at the Irish immigrants who opened accounts at this bank and the, the records for the 1850s survive. And so you can see that people who are still living in these decrepit tenements in Five Points actually have quite a bit of money. 
And, and so outward appearances don't always tell the financial story of immigrants, and that's the case today as it was back then. Now, when immigrants do well in New York, they tend to eventually move out of those immigrant neighborhoods. And so in this period, if you're an Irish immigrant and you made enough money, you would move to a place like Brooklyn. And that would be where you go. Or you'd move uptown, but, but Brooklyn, Jersey City, those were the two places you kind of went when you had made it in New York and didn't have to live in a place like Five Points anymore. Now, the Irish weren't the only immigrant group during this period. The two groups I talk about when I talk about the, ninth, the period from about 1800 to 1880 in the book are the Irish and the Germans. The Germans tend to get forgotten about in American immigration history, but in fact, more Germans have immigrated to the United States than people from any other place in all of US history. But we tend not to hear about that so much. In part, that's because of the two world wars where German, after, during and after which German Americans did everything they could to hide their German background. And so as a result, German Americans were not as, as kind of um, effusive with their German heritage as other Americans were in the 20th century. But that wasn't the case in the 19th century. In the 19th century, German New Yorkers made just as big a deal about their heritage and celebrated it as did the Irish. And New York was famous for its beer gardens and beer halls, which were huge cavernous places where literally thousands of people would gather on a Sunday to drink. Um, Germans, like the Irish, were often very entrepreneurial. I talk in the book about the Steinway family. They arrive in New York as the Steinwegs. They come from a small German principality called Braunschweig. And um, Henry Steinway on the left was a successful piano maker in Braunschweig. But the market for pianos in Braunschweig was very small. And in this period, Germany is not yet united. It's a confederation of dozens of small and big states. And they have big trade barriers between each one. So if you were a successful piano maker in Braunschweig, you couldn't really sell your pianos outside of that, of, of the principality, and so, or duchy to be exact. So Steinway, being very ambitious, decides to go to America where he thinks there's going to be a bigger market for his, for his pianos. And he comes with his, his large family of children. Um, who are all kind of young adults by the time they come to America. And Steinway is very um, meticulous about how he's going to go about this. So he doesn't just come to America and open a piano shop. He arrives, and everybody in the family is given an assignment to get a job with a New York piano shop to learn how the work is done, how the business works in America. So everybody gets a job at a different piano works, including William, I'm sorry, including Henry. Um, and they take these jobs for, for tiny, tiny pay because they're so determined to get these jobs. Some of the shops say, we don't need anybody. And they say, well, I'll work for almost nothing, just anything, because they're really spying on these other companies. And so after working for more than a year and learning the cost of the raw materials that these piano manufacturers have and the cost and how much they sell them for it and what the strengths and the weaknesses of their products are. He pulls, Henry pulls all his sons out of these various other works and opens his own piano factory. Uh, and he's a great salesman. And in particular, he takes his adult daughters, who are all very accomplished piano players, and they work the showroom as saleswomen. And they flirt with the, customer, with the male customers and show off how well the pianos sound when they play them. And they help uh, close a lot of the deals, too. And in those days, Steinway pianos weren't as expensive as they are now. Um, but in, in really about 15 years, Steinway pianos become famous in America. And by the late 1860s, he goes from a small shop in Lower Manhattan to a huge factory that takes up an entire city block on Park Avenue in what's now kind of the low uh, 60s. And then eventually, by the, 18, by the end of the 1870s, he's so successful that he closes down that one block wide factory and opens an entire factory village in what's now Queens. So obviously, not every German immigrant is ex as successful as the Steinways. Um, but they do exemplify the hard work that immigrants are willing to put, uh, put in and the ingenuity they often use to accomplish their goals. 
Now, by the time Steinway opens his factory in Queens, Germans and Irish are no longer the, the biggest immigrant groups arriving in New York. Um, Eastern European Jews are. Um, they tend to settle in the same place that the Germans had settled, which was the place that will eventually be called the Lower East Side of Manhattan. And by about 1900, when hundreds of thousands of Eastern European Jews have settled there, the Lower East Side becomes the most densely populated place on Earth. As one newspaper reporter put it, quote, the supreme sensation of the East Side is the sensation of its astounding populousness. The architecture seems to sweat humanity at every window and door. Uh, according to this, this uh, reporter, that in comparison to these heaving tenement blocks, that was his term, a crowded midtown thoroughfare at the height of rush hour was a, quote, uninhabited desert. Now, one of the things about the Lower East Side that visitors often commented upon was not just how crowded it was, but how noisy it was. And we're not talking about just your, your typical, you know, you think today, urban sounds. You think about automobiles. But keep in mind, there, there are no automobiles. You think about the sound of, you know, the subway maybe, but there, was no, there were no subways. There, there were some trains on the street. It was the sound of the people because these buildings were so crowded and the people would tend to not spend very much time in their apartments, but they'd hang out on their street. And both day and night, there was just, you know if you're, if you're in a, a large theater right before the show starts, there's that buzz of all the people talking? That was what it sounded like on the Lower East Side all day and even most of the night because there were people who were up even far into the night out on the sidewalks um, and lots of street vendors as well. So the work that the Eastern European Jews focused on in New York was garment work. Um, the United States had a huge demand for ready-made clothing. Um, all these immigrants who are coming to the United States, a um, lot of them are single men. They don't have women to sew clothes for them, so they need ready-made clothes. And the huge American middle class, uh, the women in those families who once would have been expected to sew clothes for their families, they don't want to do that sewing anymore. Plus, it's considered a sign of kind of having made it that, that your clothes are machine made and very regular and not homemade and looking kind of homespun. So garment workers are in huge demand and Eastern European Jews fill that void. In part, they're able to fill that void because other uh, American men don't want to do that work because clothing making is considered women's work and beneath men. But these Eastern European Jews are willing to take that work. Um, among the Eastern European Jews doing that work were the Anbinders from Haleskov, Ukraine. So this is an image of, this is my grandfather, Tulia Anbinder, after whom I'm named. Uh, he unfortunately died a couple years before I was born, so I never met him. I did, however, meet my great aunt Florence. That's her. Um, and then these are Tulia and Florence's other siblings. Um, and that's my great grandmother. So Florence is the only one of these people who I ever met. Um, the reason this picture was taken is that Tulia's father, her husband, Freum Lieb Anbinder, came to America in 1911. And he did what was very common, what all the immigrant groups I've described did uh, throughout American history. One member of the family would come to America, and they would establish a foothold. They would start earning money. And when they had saved up enough money, they would then bring the rest of the family over, sometimes one at a time, sometimes all together. So for the Irish, it was typically one at a time. So you'd send whoever it seemed was most likely to make money in America. You'd send them to New York. They'd work as either a day laborer or a domestic servant if you were a woman. And when they saved enough money, you'd send that back to Ireland and bring over the second sibling. And then now the two of you would work to bring over the third sibling. And then the three of you would work to bring over the fourth sibling. And that was how one by one you would bring over a whole family. And if you're already married with kids, the, typically the husband would go and he would work until he could save up enough money 
And with the Irish, very often, you would then just bring one other member of the family. Like, you might bring the wife, and the kids would stay with the grandparents until you saved enough money to bring them over, too. But sometimes you brought over one of the kids if they were old enough and left the mother with the younger kids until they could be brought over. And Germans did the same thing. Eastern European Jews did the same thing. Now, Freud Lieb had this big family he had left behind. And they did not want to send them one at a time. And really, most of them weren't old enough to, to work. I suppose these, these great aunts who I didn't meet could have gotten jobs in garment factories. But Jews considered it uncouth to send an unmarried woman unaccompanied to America, because you know who know, would know what would happen on the ship. Um, so Freud Lieb decides, like most Jews did, they're not going to bring the family over until they can afford to bring them all over. So that starts in 1911. What happened from time to time, though, was a, a man would go to America. He would maybe meet another woman who he liked better than his, his old wife, and he'd abandon his family. So it was very common for people like this to get photos taken and send them to New York to the person who was there to say, hey, don't forget about us. Don't think about abandoning us. And so there actually, we have three of these pictures because 1911, Freud Lieb comes over. He's not able to save enough money working as a presser in a garment shop, which is the lowest paid job. Um, he can't save enough money to bring all six of them over before World War I starts. And once World War I starts, it's both more expensive to bring them over and more dangerous. So they decide to wait till the war is over. But who knew that the war would last five years? So we have three of these pictures. In the first one, this one, Tulia is very little. The next one, He's bigger, and by the third one, he's 15 years old. And so the family's not reunited until 19, the end of 1923, so 12 years elapse um, between the time one goes and, uh, and the rest uh, are reunited. And so today, chain migration has become part of the news again because there's this call now to eliminate chain migration um, because of the idea that that you're bringing family members who might be undesirable. But chain migration has very much, you know, there's no person in America whose ethnic group did not practice chain migration in abundance. So if we, if we stop chain migra migration, which in theory we could do, it would be a brand new thing. It wouldn't be restoring something old. It would be, it would be setting a new precedent. Now, the other big group that comes in this period are Italian immigrants. Um, more Italians come to America than any other group in the late 19th and early 20th century, though in New York, they are second to the Eastern European Jews. Italians tend to do what my family did. They send the man over. That man works uh, and sometimes brings the rest of the family over. But Italians tended to come when they were young men and they weren't married. Their intention typically was not to actually immigrate, but simply to come to America, work and save some money for a while, and then go back to Italy and either pay off family debts, build a house, buy a farm, things of that sort. But a lot of, and that's been the case throughout American history. A lot of people come to America not planning to stay, but then for one reason or another decide to. Sometimes it's because they discover it's much harder to earn money and become rich in America than they'd expected, and they're embarrassed to go back. They had left saying, I'm going to become rich and come back and lord it all over you. And when they can't do that, they, they don't want to go back and show their face. In other cases, they end up simply liking America better than they had expected. So for all those reasons, people will end up staying. And so I think you can probably say that a majority of Italians didn't start out as immigrants, but started out planning to only stay temporarily. But the vast majority ends up staying permanently. And in order to help save money to, to buy that farm and, and so forth, they would live in conditions like this. So this is a, a kind of a, a bunkhouse in an apartment in Five Points, actually. Uh, and this is a photo by Jacob Reese. You can see one, two, three, four, five, six people in the photo. And this picture, believe it or not, is of a 12 by 12 foot room. right? So maybe your typical Arlington bedroom. And that's six people. And the photographer, Jacob Reese, said that there were actually 13 people sleeping in the room. But he is standing on one side, and there are people sleeping. Here's the seventh person. There are people sleeping all around him. And he doesn't have a wide-angle lens, so this is all he can get in the picture. 
One of my favorite stories I tell in the book is about this guy with the pickaxe here, Pascal D'Angelo. Um, you know, we tend uh, often to think of these immigrants, and certainly people in the day thought of immigrants as kind of uneducated, brutish people who have nothing but their, their muscles and their strong backs. Pascal D'Angelo was a, a day laborer. He, he worked on, in a train yard um, in New Jersey, right across the river from New York. But like many immigrants, he aspired to something better than manual labor. In his case, he aspired to be a poet. And so he works for years as a, as a day laborer uh, in the rail yard, teaches himself English, uh, goes to the public library in New Jersey and borrows books and teaches himself English, learns about the great romantic poets and aspires to be one. And he eventually, uh, after 10 years in America, quits his work here and moves to Brooklyn to become a poet. And, uh, and he has his 15 minutes of fame. He's discovered and, and, and published. And he's not a great poet. So the guy who discovers him, who, who's a judge of a poetry contest, says, well, I can't give you the first place prize, but I can write a little article about you. And so he writes this article about him, and he gets some poetry published. And the guy who discovers him, who's a, a Columbia University literature professor, suggests that he writes his a memoir, because his story going from you know, becoming the pick, act, pick and shovel poet was so extraordinary. And so he writes this memoir, and he gets his 15 minutes of fame. His, his, his story is printed across the United States. His book sells well. But he's very determined to, to make money just on poetry, and poetry doesn't pay very well. And all these people, these wealthy Italian Americans, once he becomes famous, say, oh, let me be your patron. Let me pay for you to go to college. Let me, you know. And he's like, no, I only want money from people buying my poetry and publishing it. But the Great Depression starts, and there isn't much money for this. And he goes a little mad, and he ends up dying uh, this kind of sordid, impoverished death where he has appendicitis. And he's apparently uh, afraid to go to the hospital because he can't afford to pay for it. And so he dies of something that really you shouldn't die of uh, during the Great Depression. You know, so not every immigrant story ends, uh, ends as, as successfully as you might hope. Now, it's in that period, in the 1920s and 30s, that the immigration restriction laws that I mentioned before are put into place. So restrictions so that hardly any Eastern European Jews can come to America, hardly any Italians. right? So you had, at this point, well over 100,000 immigrants from those places coming each year to America. The new restrictions say that fewer than 5,000 a year can come from those places. So immigration is pretty much cut off. The only places that can send Immigrants in pretty much limited num unlimited numbers are Ireland, England, um, and that's pretty much it. And so as a result, um, and, and there aren't very many English or Irish who want to come to the United States at this point. So immigration drops off to, you know, by well over 90% from what it had been. And that's the case from 1924 to 1965. Now, there is, however, there are some people who can come to the United States who are kind of like immigrants, but aren't exactly immigrants. And in this period in New York, it's Puerto Ricans. So as Eastern European Jews stop taking jobs in garment factories, uh, the factory owners start looking for workers. And they discover that in Puerto Rico, there are people who are poor um, and who can come to the United States because they're American citizens, and there's no restriction on them coming at all. And so you have what's like an immigration from Puerto Rico to New York, and a huge number of Puerto Ricans coming to the United States. But they're not exactly immigrants because they're already Americans. Their experience is very much like immigrants, but it's not legally like immigrants because they don't, you know, they don't have this Ellis Island experience of, of having to kind of run the gauntlet and be accepted into America. They can come and go as they please. Um, so I talk about Puerto Ricans in the book, but not as much as some other groups, just because, um, because they're not exactly like the other immigrants, and the book's pretty long already. So I talk more in the book about Dominicans. In 1965, when the immigration restrictions that had been in place for 40 years are repealed, um, 
people start coming to the United States from places that Congress did not expect. What Congress expected when they repealed those restrictions was that Italians and Eastern European Jews would come again. Um, but instead, people start coming from other places, typically places where the United States military had gotten involved and given people a taste of what Americans were like. The United States Army had occupied the Dominican Republic several times in the 20th century. And so when these immigration laws are eased, Dominicans start coming to New York in large numbers. Their Lower East Side is Washington Heights here around the George Washington Bridge. Um, one of the most famous of the Dominican immigrants in New York is Oscar de la Renta, the fashion designer. He's not a typical Dominican immigrant by any means. Um, but he, he, I, I tell his story in part because what you have from the Dominican Republic, like you have from a lot of places, is not just poor people coming to the United States, but a lot of middle class people. And, and Americans tend to think, oh, each country must be sending their poorest people to America. But that's almost never the case. You know, the potato famine is the one exception. Because for the most part, the poorest people in any country can't afford to immigrate, because immigrating costs a lot of money. So the Dominican Republic's another example where a lot of the people who come to the United States are actually middle class people who found, uh, you know, in, in De La Renta's case, his family uh, was kind of on the outs with the dictator of, of the nation. And so they came, uh, they went first to Europe and then to the United States. So then I finally in the book get to the modern period which I kind of define as the 1990s to today. And there are three main groups I talk about in the book when I talk about immigrants today. The first is Dominicans. The second are West Indians. Um, and that's a term used to describe um, the people from the Caribbean, mostly to describe the people from the Caribbean who speak English, so the Anglophone Caribbean. So that's people from Jamaica, from Trinidad and Tobago, places like that. Um, but it also includes one large French speaking group and that's people from Haiti. And so um, large numbers of people come from those countries and come to New York, especially women from those countries come to New York because there's a huge demand for home health aids, for nurses, and because these women speak English, um, they're more eligible for these jobs than, say, the Dominicans who speak Spanish. And so there's a seeming never-ending need for home health workers, nurses, nannies, and, and uh, women from these countries fill these jobs. Often there is uh, conflict between them and other groups in New York. Uh, this is in 1991 when there was a riot in, in Crown Heights part of Brooklyn, uh, which central Brooklyn, which is still dominated by uh, immigrants from uh, the West Indies. Uh, and this is a scene there is Mayor Dinkins in the middle there trying to, trying to cool the tempers between the Jewish population and the, the West Indian population. And so I talk in the book about them. And then the other group I talk about are the Chinese. The Chinese are about to become the biggest immigrant group in New York. Dominicans still hold that, that uh, place, but they're about to be displaced. The Chinese actually have been coming to New York ever since the 1850s, but I focus on them in the 1980s and 1990s. And I, I show this picture because we, we tend to forget this, but in the 1990s, when you thought of the term illegal immigrant, you didn't think of someone from Latin America, you thought of the Chinese. And the famous example was this ship, the Golden Venture. So many Chinese were trying to get into the country illegally um, that the smugglers would rent whole ships and smuggle them across the Pacific or Atlantic and try to then land them in America. When this ship, and it's a huge long story, but when this ship is at sea for nine months without being able to land its, its people, that's why this, this man here is so, is so gaunt. And after nine months, they finally decide, we're just going to sail the ship into, uh, onto the beach in Queens and tell everybody to jump off. And that's what they do, except that half the people refuse to jump off. And that was smart, because a lot of the people drown in the surf. Um, 
And so this was the face of illegal immigration in the early 1990s. This, this took place at the very beginning of the, of the Clinton administration. Um, one of the things I talk about in the book is how similar the Chinese immigrant story is to those of previous generations. So this is a Chinese bunk room in the exact same neighborhood that I showed, that Italian bunk room, right? The former Five Points, neighbor, five points neighborhood. Uh, the only difference is now the Chinese have triple bunks instead of the double bunks that the Italians have. Uh, and this is, again, this is one of those 12 by 12 foot rooms, but now crammed full of Chinese immigrants. So I've run out of time, so I'll just show you here. This is a map of New York's immigrant neighborhoods today. This is South Brooklyn, where the West Indians concentrate. The Chinese population of New York is so big now that it's completely outgrown Chinatown. And now this part of Brooklyn is also predominantly Chinese. And then this part of Queens, Flushing, predominantly Chinese as well. Though Flushing kind of has people from all over Asia. And then you can see up on the top is where the Dominicans tend to congregate. Uh, but then you've got people from the former Soviet Union down here in Brighton Beach. Guyana, which is on the northern coast of South America. A big population in New York here, uh, and so forth. But of course, the situation is much more complicated than this map can convey. This is a map that I made. And believe it or not, this just shows the five biggest immigrant groups in New York. It, it, it's, I aspired to have a map that showed all the immigrant groups of New York, and it's just not, it's just not possible. It, 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 it doesn't work. So suffice it to say that the fact that the Chinese would go to such lengths as to crash a ship on the shores on the beach in Queens, um, and the fact that so many people from all over the world still aspire to move to New York shows that despite all the ways in which the world has changed over the past 400 years, that New York remains almost uniquely still the world's city of dreams. Thank you. If anybody has a question, please wait for the microphone. Well, it seems we're having a replay of uh, our president's description. In 1924, as you said, uh, quotas were taken away from Southern Europeans, Italians, and Eastern Europeans, Jews, Poles, and given to Northern Europeans. So those were the shithole places that they were taken away and given to, as the president said, people like from Norway. So it's the same thing, but many, many years later, so not much growth, maybe. Definitely the same thing, right? The, the, the countries, each generation, the countries that are considered those countries changes. Ireland was considered that place once, a place where everybody's poor, nobody can read or write, and therefore, how can these immigrants possibly become good Americans? And then people said the same things about uh, Germans who seem to get drunk all the time. And, and, uh, and then they said it about Jews, and then they said it about Italians, and so, right. There is no immigrant group about which that has never been said, except the English. <laughs> the English are the only group that seems to, to never be resented. This isn't really important, but my friend read, you know, Ron Chernow's book about Alexander Hamilton, and she said his mother was, like, part African, but you said, he was of Scottish descent. Correct. So there were rumors that his mother was partially of African descent. But I, those were the kind of things that political enemies would say to try to, to, try to, to tarnish your reputation. So there's no evidence for that. Okay. Hey, can you uh, finish the story of the Ann Binder family and how we got to today? Sure. Um, so it's obviously more complicated. The first of my ancestors came, who came to America came from Germany, southwest Germany. They came in around 1850. And they started out in Buffalo, and then eventually left Buffalo and went to New York City. Um, so that's one part of the family. That's on my mother's side. And those Germans from Buffalo eventually married um, married my great-grandfather on my mother's side, who was from 
He was from what's now Poland and was then Poland, but when he got to America, he said he was German, which is a common thing that people often not say where they're really from. Now, technically he was correct because the part of Poland he was from had been, was occupied and colonized by Prussia, which was part of Germany. So he was technically correct to say that he was German because he was a German citizen because Prussia had taken over his part of Poland. Um, and so I'm curious to know whether he admitted to his wife, my great grandmother, that he was Polish and not German because she was from a very proudly German family. But, uh, but I don't know because I, I didn't meet either of those great grandparents. And then the Ann Binders, um, like so many Eastern European Jews, once the rest of the family comes over in 1923 and 24, um, the story is typical in one way because they, here, let's go back to the picture just so I can show you. So, I can show you. so when, they, when these guys get to Ellis Island, the family is detained because the people on Ellis Island say, you're too sickly. You, we're not sure you're going to survive, and if, you do, if, if we let you out now, you might infect people with whatever it is you have. And in fact, what the family did was, so if you look at the Ellis Island hospital records, this this uh, girl who died, who died before she even uh, made it to 20 years old, she's listed as being like nine years old. And I did the math and I was like, for, they've been separated 11 years. How can she be nine years old? And what I discovered was that the family, she was so sickly and had always been so sickly that she was very small for her age. So when the boat got to Ellis Island, they lied and said she was nine when she was really 12, because if they had said she was 12, they would have looked at her and said, oh, she's so sickly, she can't possibly be admitted to America. And so they had to stay um, because she was so sick and my grandfather was so sick. They had to stay in the Ellis Island Hospital for more than a month before they would, would let them out. Um, and so they eventually, then they joined with Freund Lieb, who's the presser. They moved to Brooklyn. And Freund Lieb starts his own kind of uh, garment contracting business where they make uh, baby clothes and sell them to retailers and department stores. And Tulia starts out working in a garment factory. Um, and he wants to be a doctor, but he finds that Eastern European Jews with thick accents aren't and, re and have recently immigrated can't get into American medical schools. So he goes to, to dental school, since he can't get into medical school, and he becomes a dentist. And, um, but he, too, remained kind of sickly throughout his life, and so he dies in his early 50s, a little before I was born, and that's why I was named after him. Yeah. I just wanted to thank you because I really enjoyed reading your book. I'm a fifth generation New Yorker. I grew up in Queens on Steinway Street. <laughs> I went to Stuyvesant High School. Ironically, in the 60s, 80% of the kids there were Jews. I'm sure Peter was rolling in his grave. <laughs> the question that I want to ask, though, is there are some legal and some technological changes in the world of 2017, 18, that were different 100 years ago. One of them, uh, a number of court cases in the 70s and 80s permitted American citizens to maintain dual nationality. That had not been the case. The other thing is a technological one. Immigration in 1910 was pretty much an irrevocable decision. You couldn't go back. There were no airplanes. In putting together your patterns of dis uh, immigration today, what kind of studies of surveys and attitudes of immigrants today. Oh, is it still seeing it? Is it revocable? Hey, I'm coming to America. Or is it, gee, I, it's a good idea to have a second passport? Well, so that's complicated. I guess I would say a few things. Um, so even though I would say that the dual nationality thing isn't as big a change as you might think, because to me, what's more important is, is, is in your mind how you think of yourselves. And immigrants have always thought of themselves as kind of these in-between people who are part of two cultures. And so I don't think 
the fact that you can have two passports makes people think all that differently than they thought before. Um, you know, so for I'm leave who's not in the picture, but I know from the stories I've heard from my father is that that Freud and Lieb in Brooklyn socialized totally with other people from Holoskov. That was his total social circle, was people from Holoskov. Um, same with, um, with, his, with my mother's family. The way I was able to eventually, because my mother's family doesn't know nearly as much about their background as my father's. And the way I was able to eventually figure out where they were from is because I went to the cemetery in, in Queens where they're buried, and those, part, those people are buried in a part of the cemetery that was owned by this burial society. And the burial society's name, I couldn't figure out what its significance was. And I eventually found uh, somebody who was fluent in Yiddish, and he was able to say, oh, yeah, that's a town in Moldova. And that was how I discovered that that part of the family was all from this town in Moldova. And so they, too, it turns out, all associated with each other and, and lived in this you know, tenement full of people from this one part of Moldova. So, so I don't think the change in the 1970s is that big a change for the way immigrants view, view themselves. I think immigrants have always seen themselves as, as members of, of more than one society. And what was the other that you had one? Other? Oh, going back. So yeah, I, I think, uh, I, I hate to contradict, but I would say that, that you're a little mistaken there, that immigrants, um, lots of people go back, have gone back, um, both to visit and to live. I mean, the Italians are the most famous example, right? Probably a third of all Italian Americans living in New York went back permanently to live in Italy. But, it's kind of a myth that people didn't go back. They went back all the time. Even my, you know, my German uh, ancestors, I, I find their passport records on ancestry, they went back and forth to Germany all the time to visit relatives. And so there was a lot more back and forth than, than people imagined. You didn't need a jet plane to do that kind of thing. Could you comment a little bit on the Scandinavian experience? Sure. So there are two main reasons I didn't talk about Scandinavians today. Um, one is New York has a relatively very small Scandinavian population compared to other parts of America. Um, the, the kind of biggest, most famous Scandinavian population in New York is Norwegians in Brooklyn. They were a big part of the, the shipbuilding, sailing, longshoremen world of Brooklyn. So in part, I was able to justify not including them because when they were a big factor in Brooklyn, Brooklyn was not part of New York City yet. Um, and then, again, as I said at the beginning of the talk, I had to cut somewhere. And so one of the decisions was, since Scandinavians have never been such a big presence in New York, they were one of the groups to cut. So I had lots of research I had done on the Norwegians and, and, and so forth. And you know, when the book was already up to 700 pages, I decided, that had to go. So, but I can point you to some, some uh, stuff about Scandinavians in New York if you wanted to read more. It's not very good, I'm afraid, but, but you can, it is there. What um, qualities or characteristics of different groups have made them more successful at assimilating and um, you, you know, just economically having uh, increased their, you know, their values and so forth? Well, if, so you, two things there, assimilation and economic success. So one thing that's clear is the more money you have when you get to New York, the more money you'll end up with after having lived in New York for 20 or 30 years. So that is definitely the number one factor that, that predicts how you'll do economically in New York. Um, financially, but the other financial, uh, the, the other thing you find is immigrants who are entrepreneurial 
And, and in general, immigrants tend to be more entrepreneurial than other Americans, um, in part because they're ambitious people, they're risk takers to have immigrated in the first place, but also because often they're shut out of other lines of work and therefore have to go be self-employed because they can't get work from others. So that's the other key factor is that immigrants, so in my study of the, the people who, uh, the Irish famine immigrants, uh, the people who did the best were people who did not work for others or didn't do that forever, but worked for themselves eventually and either good salesmen or good at, so for instance, one group I found that did really well among the Irish were porters. And I didn't imagine porters would make so much money. So porters were people who would hang out at the train station or at the, at the docks and offer to carry your stuff wherever you were going. And they would carry it on their backs. And porters were you know, the richest Irish Americans, according to the bank records. Uh, you know, number one were doctors. Um, number two were lawyers. But there were hardly any Irish lawyers in New York, Irish-born lawyers. Um, number Three were policemen, um, and that's in part because if you were a policeman, you were very well politically connected. You ended up typically starting out as a policeman, ending up as a, you know, a politician, or you're getting kickbacks or bribes, whatever the case might be. And then the fourth richest group of Irish immigrants were porters. Um, no, actually fifth. The fourth richest were peddlers. So look at that, peddlers and porters. And what do they have in common? Those are people who the amount of money they make is based on how hard they work. Right? So if you're a day laborer, no matter how hard you work, you get your dollar a day. But as a peddler, the more you hustle, the longer hours you put in, the more you can sell. As a porter, you know, the, more you, the better you can negotiate with your customers, the faster you get to your destination, so you can get back to the railroad station, the more money you'll make. And so that's... That tends to be the key factor. In terms of, of assimilation, there, I wouldn't use, you know, I, I think there aren't huge differences. I, I think in the way you maybe mean it when you ask it, um, the groups that know English before they get to New York are able to move up the socioeconomic ladder faster, in, for the most part, than people who don't. But that can be mitigated by having money. So Germans are a group, don't know English, but they tend to come fairly well off and they move up faster than the other groups that don't know English. I was wondering if there was anything especially surprising or unexpected that you learned when you were writing the book. Oh, so much. Um, I mean, I'll just give you one example. So one of the things the, the Irish are famous for in New York is the draft riots during the Civil War, where it's the draft riots are, is this four days of mass rioting and, and killing with nearly a dozen African Americans lynched, um, among other things, and dozens and dozens of buildings burned to the ground um, with predominantly Irish immigrants expressing their hatred of the war and the draft in particular, and they're, they're feeling that the draft was going to particularly affect them. Um, because of this clause that said, if you, if you can pay $300, you don't have to fight. Um, so I discovered a couple of things about that that surprised me. One was that despite their expectations, hardly any Irish immigrants were forced to fight as a result of the draft. In all of five points, which had 25,000 inhabitants, there was only one person who ended up being forced into the army as a result of the draft. Um, there were various means you could get exempted, or you could just move and run away. And it was impossible to find, you know, there were so many Patrick Kellys, no way to tell which one was the right one. Also, this is a period where there is no, if you get naturalized, there's no central record keeping place that says Patrick Kelly is now an American citizen and liable for the draft. So if you got drafted, you could go into the draft board and say, you know, I'm exempt because I'm not an American citizen. And there was no way they could prove you were. And so the Irish tend to get out of it. And then the other thing I found that was interesting was that there were lots of Irish who, over the course of the war, they changed their mind. So I talk in the book about this guy named Felix Brannigan who was an Irish immigrant, um, he volunteers for the army. 
And he writes these letters to his sister back in New York during the beginning of the war, say, when they're talking about having an Emancipation Proclamation and that the freed slaves would be allowed to fight in the military because up to the Emancipation Proclamation, no African Americans were allowed in the military. And he says, this would be terrible thing. We Irish would refuse to fight alongside the blacks. And he uses the N-word and expresses how you know, this vitriol against African Americans. But then eventually the Emancipation Proclamation takes place. Blacks are allowed in the army. And they have a real trouble finding white officers who will command black units, because the rule is white officers have to command the black units. But who volunteers to command one of them? Felix Brannigan, which I found really surprising. And, his, and his, his words full of hatred and racism are in, I'm not exaggerating, 100 history books. He's like the famous example of Irish racism exemplified by the draft rights. Yet none of these books realized, because nobody had known up to this point, that Brannigan actually commands a unit of African Americans. And then after the war, he goes, he moves to Washington. He goes to law school at what becomes GW, where I teach. And then after he gets his law degree, he gets, because of his connections uh, from the army, it turns out that the US attorney in the Southern District of, Mer of, Mass of Mississippi in Jackson was an army buddy of his, a Jewish immigrant from Poland, as it turns out. And he hires Brannigan to work as an assistant US attorney in Jackson, Mississippi. And then the, the uh, Polish immigrant loses his job, and Brannigan takes his place. And so what is Brannigan's job as a US attorney in Jackson, Mississippi? He has two main jobs. One is to catch people who are trying to, uh, to smuggle liquor into the country without paying the excise tax. And the other main thing he does is prosecute Klansmen who are terrorizing African Americans. There was no way he could have gotten that job without having become a Republican. You know, to, become, to get that job during the Grand Administration, you had to be a Republican. So here he's gone from being famous racist to a Republican prosecuting Klansmen and, and volunteering where others declined to, to lead African American troops. So those kind of nuances I, I would continually find in, in, in writing the book. Hi, um, I really enjoyed reading the book. Um, and there were two aspects that I think you've shortchanged a little bit just because of time that I just- In the book or in the talk? In the book. Okay. Well, in the talk, not in the book, because I think I learned a lot. One was about some of the religion, l l religious aspects. Um, I'm a direct descendant of one of the signers of the Flushing Proclamation ah. in 1657. So that kind of caught my eye early on, but then just the way the Catholic priests had to manage the different forms of Catholicism, the, Catholic, the Protestants versus the Catholics, all of that. I think there's a whole fascinating subtext in your books about some of that. The other aspect that I, again, I'm, I grew up in New Jersey, Bergen County, so I know, New, you know, feel like I'm a New Yorker in re and all my ancestors really are from different <laughs> sides, came through New York. <clears throat> but um, the other aspect was the politics and the ties, especially during the 1800s, to, of immigrant groups and the shifting political powers and, uh, and, and how that was very much tied to ethnic politics, which I actually think has some relevance in today's world too. Sure. Yeah, as you can imagine, I can barely scrape the surface of the book in trying to do a 45 in trying to do a 45 minute talk. So yes, there's lots and lots and lots I left out. And so if you didn't hear what you were looking for, it's probably because, you know, as in your case, lacking time, I, I had to choose. All right. Well, I want to thank you all for coming. It's been a great pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much, Mr. Ambinder, for coming out tonight. It's a really great book. I encourage those of you who have not read it to please do. And hope to see you all next time. <laughs>